Welcome in, everyone, and thank you for listening to the 139th ever episode of the Missouri Sports Podcast, brought to you by 106 Apparel and recording from the Revel Advertising Studio in beautiful Springfield, Missouri. I'm one of your hosts, Cameron Albert, alongside my good friend and fellow Mizzou fan, Kyle DeVries. How are you doing today, Kyle? Uh, You're not Kyle. <laughs> no, but this is episode 140. Just Is it really? Yep. Yeah. Well, I already said 139, so it is what it is. How you doing, Kyle? I'm doing great, Cameron. How are you? I'm terrible now that I made such a blunder. Yeah, that was that was kind of sketchy, but we're gonna we're gonna move on. We'll power through. Uh, Cam, there's some news that came out today uh, regarding the shirt you're wearing. First of all, potentially in a in a roundabout way. Oh. Uh, he's wearing a Cardinals jersey. Albert Pujols is I'm wearing an Albert Pujols jersey. Going to be released from the Angels. Well, he was released by the Los Angeles Angels. Good. Come home. Yeah, I mean, we're kind of in that age where we grew up watching Albert Pujols, Cardinal baseball, and we were, I mean, that was truly what I did in my childhood. I mean, I was watching the Cardinals every day yeah. with my dad and stuff, and it seemed like every day. Yeah, but literally, my dad would holler, if I was out of the room and Albert Pujols was coming up to bat, he would holler at me like, hey, Pujols is up, like, you don't want to miss this. Yeah. Uh, I thought of Albert Pujols recently and kind of a, well, it, it was fairly recently, probably four or five years ago. I uh, was had some kind of direct TV person at my house, employee or something, trying to fix some kind of problem we had at our house. And I was on the phone with a direct TV employee as well. And she, I needed to confirm my identity. And uh, she asked for like a, uh, she asked for a security question that I had filled out previously. And the question was, who is your childhood hero? And I had answered Albert Pujols on that whenever I filled it out <laughs> but just explaining it to this lady was kind of awkward she was like who and I had to like <laughs> spell his last name and everything but did you say he's a baseball player and I don't think I said that I was just like uh <laughs> I just kind of shook my head like this is gonna be weird she's not gonna know who this is and you I should have said come on lady Albert Pujols yeah come on but um, I actually did get to uh go to one of the Cardinals games in person whenever he was here a couple summers ago with, mm. the, with the Angels and that was really cool experience to get to see him return to bush stadium for the first time since he left that I was guess. heartbreaking when he left that really was that I, was we were yeah. probably in like high school when yeah. that happened but mm-hmm. i mean looking back from a financial perspective it made sense that the cardinals were like all right like, yeah this is as high as we're gonna go right i mean that was such a massive contract it was like a 10-year yeah. contract just everybody in the world knew <clears throat> that the angels would not be getting their money's worth right like maybe even on like the whole entire back half of that contract yeah, that's but that, exactly what happened. That was still, yeah, and that was still heartbreaking though oh, when yeah. he left. Yeah, and seeing him like hit milestones, you know, uh, you know, home run milestones, RBI milestones, hit milestones in an Angels jersey is just like, oh man, it's a little bit bittersweet. I was telling Cameron earlier, um, I used to go on to like baseballreference.com and try to project out for his whole career how many home runs I thought he would have to see and I would like try to keep track of how close he would potentially get to breaking the all-time record that kind of stuff as a Cardinals fan would you welcome him back with open arms for like a one-year deal or something oh yeah yeah, me too yeah absolutely I throw out all baseball I've been logic yeah yeah yeah. no I've been like back in love with Albert Pools actually the jersey Um, I happen to you know uh, John Boy uh, who's Mm -hmm. like a YouTube sensation with yes. his baseball breakdown videos uh he was repping a company that did jerseys and i went on there and they happened to have an albert Pujols cardinals jersey brand new legit and i was like oh well that's awesome i'll get it it's actually a christmas gift wow so, yeah and there it is here it is in the flesh all, <laughs> on the all flesh. comes full circle just like you said yeah uh yeah i hope the cardinals can figure out some way to bring him back even, even if he never plays, basically. What if they have some competition? What if he wants to go play for Tony La Russa in Chicago? That would be... That would be weird. That would be very... I would not, hate that. That would be a very not happy would, time. Yeah. <laughs> he Obviously, <laughs> the only thing that can happen... You know, I don't even like the fact that you brought up other options. Okay, I'm sorry. Because the only thing that can happen is he comes back to St. Louis, retires as a Cardinal, goes into the Hall of Fame as a Cardinal. Yep. And then... Everybody lives happily ever after. after the sunset. Yes. Yep. Uh, Kyle, this isn't this is not uh, Cardinals baseball podcast. Although we're happy to talk about could Cardinals. be very well could be. Uh, but there's too much Mizzou to talk about. This is the Missouri sports podcast. We're talking about Mizzou football and basketball. 
Uh, don't forget, before we get into the meat of this episode, check us out on YouTube. Subscribe there if you can. Give us a like on our videos. That's very much appreciated. If you just listen to uh, the audio-only version on your podcast feed of choice, if you have the option to leave us a review or a rating on there, we would appreciate that. And as always, you can support the podcast directly by going over to patreon.com slash Missouri sports pod. Unless you're going to give us like a one star. Like if you're going to give us one star, then I just prefer you didn't do that. Yeah, that, Then just email us <laughs> and like just tell us why you hate us so much or what we're doing terribly. We prefer that. We'll, we'll work on it and fix it. But yeah, you don't. Yeah. Again, Kyle, just like bringing like negative scenarios <laughs> to the forefront. It's on a roll. Well, yeah. it was you that was negative last week, and it didn't work out for you. That's true. We'll get to that. That's a that's a nice little teaser for later. Um, Kyle, the first thing I think we should talk about is we got a new Mizzou basketball player, and it's a transfer incoming tra- transfer from Massachusetts, Ronnie DeGray the third. Picked Mizzou. Uh, he's a six-seven forward. Tell me if you've heard that before. And he was a three-star recruit out of high school. Averaged eight point seven points per game and six, sorry, four point six rebounds per game at Massachusetts in only fifteen games as a freshman. They had kind of a tumultuous season uh, due to COVID. Only played fifteen games. Um, had multiple like ten-day stoppages. Uh, so that was not ideal. So obviously, and, and they've had like I think six or seven players transfer out. I think this off season. Um, so yeah, Masters is not in a great spot. But Ronnie DeGray is in a much better spot now that he's in Columbia, Missouri. Conzo finally got his six seven forward. He's been he's been pining and searching yeah. for all this time. He I think uh, I think Javon Brazil is um, <laughs> listed at six seven. Yeah, you're really right. Um, yeah, I was, I was pretty excited about this, and uh, whenever Ronnie announced he was transferring, I don't know, 10 days ago or so, um, I had a pretty good feeling that Mizzou would at least be in the running for this, and his recruitment was pretty quiet. After he announced he was transferring, really didn't hear anything about him, didn't hear about his offers he was getting. He didn't put out a list of any sort. Didn't hear about uh, even what his chances might be with Mizzou. Sometimes, you know, we have a pretty good pretty good idea of where somebody's going to end up before they announce but knew nothing coming into his announcement uh yesterday uh but ronnie had a had an offer from mizzou coming out of high school um i think he had a good relationship with Conzo martin but you mentioned a connection that he had with a high school teammate uh well the high school that he went to the prep school that he went to in connecticut kind of was a pipeline to umass Mm. um so he yeah joined a couple high school teammates in massachusetts but he specifically said in an interview with Power Mizzou that he always kind of wanted to come to Mizzou, even in high school. That was a, that was one of his finalists. Um, loved Conzo Martin and kind of, you know, talked about wanting to seek development not only in basketball but as a man. And so, if you want that, then you're yeah. coming in Missouri. Yeah. That's, that's Conzo Martin is number one for that. Yes, <laughs> and nobody does it better. So uh, that makes all the sense in the world why he was a match. Uh, outside of basketball but for basketball um, I think this is a I think this is a great addition because um, yeah and he's definitely not a center he's not a five he's not gonna fill the Jeremiah Tillman role but he is gonna be able to potentially guard the five I think he can guard one through five is, is what he said he can do we'll, uh, we'll see if he actually is put in that role but he's a versatile defender and he'll he'll be able to shoot a little bit. You know, he, he shot 37% from three on pretty limited shots. But yeah, 10 for 27. Yeah, so I think that that is something Mizzou will try and get him to do a little bit more, though. I think they'll try and probably play the, the three or four spot mostly, and he'll probably step out and try and stretch the floor a little bit. Yeah, he was efficient um, around the rim. He shot 61% from two in those 15 games, and he played quite a bit, 67% of minutes and had an offensive rating of 108, which we know um, is, you don't even have to look at Mizzou's stats to know that would have been one of the better offensive ratings on the squad last year. So at this point, still looks like um, Jordan Wilmore is gonna have playing time. I was about to say, who plays in the post next year? That's gonna be my follow-up. It just depends on what lineup they wanna run with, but I mean, if they wanna 
I'm trying to think what did they do when Jeremiah Tillman didn't play for a stretch of games? Did Kobe play the five? Well, they had Mitch. True. So that's true. I don't know. I really don't know. I mean, I, I just don't think we're ever going to see Ronnie playing the five, really, probably in any scenario. I guess it's possible in a super small lineup, but I don't know if Kobe's playing the five either. So No, I can't imagine. Trayvon Brazil, not really. So Jordan Wilmore may not have a lot of competition for that five spot. We'll have to see, I guess, what how Yaya Kita is yeah. doing with his rehab. But That's the thing that is the biggest question mark because if he had played a full senior season hadn't gotten in, injured we would have a much better idea of if he would be able to com- come in and contribute day one i don't see a single player on missouri's roster right now that i feel comfortable with defending sec post players next season i agree with that i think there's a few players that could develop into that before their time in Columbia is over. But for next season, I still see that as a, a pretty big hole to fill. Yeah. yeah I, I do think the game has changed in the last few years to where, you know, you don't need like a 6'11 guy just, you know, clogging up the seven middle. Foot three? Clogging up the floor. <laughs> clogging up the middle of the floor. 7'3. Uh, now, now, you do need that. If you don't have a 7'3 guy, then you're screwed. Uh, so Mizzou's good there. But, I mean, honestly, it, it's going to be really interesting i th- i think that mizzou can i mean they're gonna have to figure out who can guard down low somebody's gonna have to do it i think kobe can guard the big guy we'll see if ronnie can do that but it's it's gonna be interesting and that's part of what makes this upcoming season so intriguing is that we're gonna have a lot of questions answered right away what if we just play like you know top five fastest tempo in the country play small just run up and down the floor fast break every every play well if we can figure out how to shoot i think i'd be 100 percent in favor of that yeah there's some question marks going whole new team i mean it's just a whole new group of guys though we (laughs) don't know we have no idea what what and play like the thing to remember is all of these guys have multiple years of eligibility yeah yeah ronnie's got four years of eligibility if he's allowed to play that extra year yeah so yeah, three next, years at the minimum. Yeah, next year is not going to be the year to judge this. All these incoming players, they're going to need some time to gel and get used to playing SEC basketball. And we got to figure out who's going to play the five. Uh, that's all I have for basketball news. So we will switch gears a little bit and talk about some football transfers that Mizzou has had and maybe now have their eyes on and the first one is jordan johnson a wide receiver transfer from notre dame uh, he's a 6-1 wide receiver from DeSmet high school in st louis he was the number 37 player in the country in 2020 and was the number one in missouri yeah 24 7 sports r- composite rivals. had um what's his name defensive player went to oregon um dante manning no, but the other one, the other one. Uh, I can't remember. The time uh, I, I looked I at it. I looked I at it the other day. I can't remember either. I should have never brought it up. Yeah, Jordan Johnson, number one player in the state of Missouri. Um, <laughs> it, it, Missouri got a shot here. I mean, they've got to be reaching out, right? Yeah, I mean, do they have a shot? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, does he want to come back to Missouri? We don't know. Um, but does he want playing time? probably uh, so that's something that he'll most certainly get right away if he comes back to missouri he didn't i'm not sure he played a down at notre dame he, he was there for one year i'm not sure if he ever saw the field at all uh, but he definitely didn't see the field as much as he wanted to that's for sure so yeah i mean playing time is is available um and he did tweet something kind of interesting uh when coach drinkwitz was kind of in at the beginning stages, uh, so I don't even think he would have made it to campus at Notre Dame yet. I think it was kind of like this time last year he was already committed to Notre Dame. Mm-hmm. But Coach Drinkwitz was kind of talking. I don't know where he was talking, but um, some kind of In event. front of boosters or something like that, yeah. Mm-hmm. And he was talking about, you know, recruiting in Missouri and the importance of keeping guys in state. And, you know, if there's a 
there's a really good player in Missouri and there's a really good player in Orlando, Florida, we're going to recruit that guy from Missouri. Everything that, else equal. That, we're taking the guy from St. Louis. Yes. Yeah. St. Louis specifically is yeah. what he is, what he said. So, and uh, Jordan Johnson said something like, this is how it always should have been. And yeah. so obviously a lot of his recruiting process was when Barry Odom was still here. Alluding to the fact that St. Louis wasn't a priority. 100%. So, which um, is just a head scratching thing to even think about, but yeah. So maybe he, uh, it, it seems at least on the, from the outside looking in that maybe he, he thinks highly of, of coach. And, uh, I think we've got a good shot here, but I said that about James and Williams also, and I was very, very wrong. So yeah, we, had, we had James and Williams, uh, penciled into the starting line. We really just did. About, um, we were saying he was going to be like a Mizzou great or yeah. something last week. Uh, he could be a part of the greatest <laughs> receiving core in Mizzou history. Yeah. So that, that was true at the time. He could have done that. That's not wrong, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, that's that's a, that's a, something that made all the sense in the world also was Jameson Williams wanting to come back to, to Mizzou and that he didn't even seem to have Mizzou as a finalist, really. So Yeah. Um, unless you have anything more about Mr. Johnson, Jameson Williams committed to Alabama. <laughs> so, yeah, our laughing is like, oh, and we, <laughs> we thought he might come to Missouri and he ends up at Alabama. Yeah. Um, obviously a lot of people, their immediate reaction is, well, if he couldn't get playing time at Ohio state and that's why he was leaving, what makes him think he'll get playing time at Alabama? Um, I don't think people quite understand how incredibly fast he is. And Alabama puts wide receivers in the NFL every single season, just about. So, yeah, I think the big difference here is. Uh, Ohio State has some of their best wide receivers returning. Um, they were able to use another year of eligibility. And so some of the guys that were ahead of him on the depth chart were getting more playing time than him last year are returning. And so not only are they bringing in more guys, but the guys that were already ahead of him are not leaving. And that is not necessarily the case at Alabama because they just had Jalen Waddell and Devonta Smith get drafted. And so there seem, seems like there could be a l- maybe a little bit more playing time available. At least – more open competition yeah so but i i mean i obviously share that sentiment a a little bit as well that it just seems a little bit silly yeah to go from ohio state looking for playing time and then go to alabama but well i uh i happen to be looking at some like an ohio state blog or fan site or something like that and uh a lot of the commenters there were saying that they they really wanted him to switch to cornerback at Ohio State they thought he could be really good on the defensive side of the ball and it just kind of blew my mind that we're talking about that this is the same player Ohio State fans don't want him to leave they want him to transition to cornerback and Mizzou fans are looking at him as you know one of the best players to ever come to their football program and if it weren't for the once in a lifetime get of dgb we'd be talking about the best wide receiver recruit to ever pick missouri if it went that way and that's just insane for me to think about it really shows you how much of a difference is between a school like mizzou and a school like ohio state and they're i mean they're basically the same level they're both you know missouri's an sec school yeah they're both uh power five programs and dominant program and dominant conferences but yeah, there's there's a potentially better chance that he might learn a completely new position just to stay at a, pr- a very prestigious. But university. and that's like the mindset of the fans. There is like, you know, this guy who was the the top player in his state would be one of the best players ever for his hometown school that plays in the SEC. You know, oh, we don't want him to leave. We want him to play defense. Right. It's it's enough. And, that, and I don't blame those fans for thinking that. Sure. Like that's just the culture that. They're just so Winning, used to talent. Know, yeah. Yeah. And uh, it's such an uphill battle for for coaches at, at a school like Missouri. Um, not just Missouri, but all types of those kind of programs oh, yeah. that are just that next tier or two down yeah. from uh, an Alabama or Ohio State. It's just an uphill battle whenever you're recruiting against programs well, like Missouri that. Missouri just lost a guy that never played and was affiliated with the program for a couple months to Georgia. Well, is he at Georgia yet? Uh, no, he's, he's he did get an offer from uh, from Georgia. That is, it seems uh, like that might be. That was Perkins, the yeah. the pretty highly rated cornerback that committed to Mizzou or enrolled at Mizzou like three months ago, ends up just this past week decommitting with the starters. Practicing. I mean, the coach was 
talking very highly of him and everything. I mean, he was definitely running with the ones and the twos in spring ball. Uh, then just randomly transfers out of Missouri after being there for three months and almost instantaneously is, uh, you know, posting offers from some of the top schools in the country. So that was a little bit of a strange, strange situation. Yeah. But as a Mizzou fan or any other fan bases that are, you know, kind of at that same level, that's just to be expected at this point. Like, and to be honest, Missouri's doing the same thing to lesser programs. I mean, it, it does. It's not as obvious. I mean, Missouri isn't reaping the benefits of extra transfer um, fluidity in football quite like they are in basketball. Um, obviously, there was more of a need for that on the basketball side with how many seniors graduated, but um, the football side hasn't quite seen that. But we do have um, Mookie Cooper um, from Ohio State. So if it seems like maybe. You know, there's two ways Missouri can benefit from the transfers. They can scoop up the top players from, you know, lesser programs, or we can bring some guys home or scoop up some kind of leftovers on the top tier programs. So Missouri's just going to kind of have to live in that space. And, and, and this has been the story for Missouri, you know, obviously going back to Gary Pinkle era where you got to be able to develop talent and take, three star guys and turn them into NFL draft picks. Speaking of NFL draft picks, actually, Kyle, I can't quite go into that segue. There was a, a recruit, um, that's got the Mizzou Twitter, uh, excited. He's got some 24 uh, seven crystal ball picks to end up at Missouri. Yeah, that is uh, Marquise Graciel and he's a defensive lineman. And yeah, he's like a, he's a four-star player, and would obviously be very helpful. But uh, there's been kind of some some rumors, some murmuring on on Twitter about uh, a commitment happening soon, and I think there's a pretty good chance that it's going to be him. And some of the assistant coaches are even like liking some of these kind of rumor tweets about getting excited about a potential um, addition coming soon. So I would keep your keep your eyes on Marquise Grayson for sure. I think he's going to be an addition to Missouri squad potentially in the next couple weeks okay I want your official prediction on Jordan Johnson and I really don't know what else competition he's looking at so I mean I think it makes sense for him to to come home I I say if I had to make a prediction I say he's he's gonna go to Mizzou I'm gonna say no, I'm gonna say he doesn't, and I'm gonna say just something random. I'm gonna say he goes to. You're gonna uh, pick the field. Yeah, but I'll even make a prediction. I'm gonna. This it will never come true, but I'm gonna say he's gonna go to Florida State. He's gonna pull a camera on Fletcher. Yeah, maybe that's why that was on the top of mind. Uh, did we ever mention that? I don't think so. I don't think we did. That's now very tangentially related to Mizzou. All we did mention was like a month before he committed was that Florida State was a destination that made sense for him. Yeah. They seemed interested, and they are all about, like, they don't even, like, look at a player's film. It seems like they're just like, okay, wingspan yes, for your position, 99th percentile, here's a scholarship yes, offer. Yes, long arms, <laughs> uh, versatile defender, yeah. here's a scholarship. Yeah. All right, so now we can get into the NFL draft results. We previewed um, all the players we thought would get drafted or could get drafted last week, and um, there ended up being... Five Missouri Tigers get drafted into the NFL. Uh, Larry Roundtree was picked in the sixth round by the Los Angeles Chargers. Joshua Bledsoe in the sixth round by the New England Patriots. Larry Borum in the fifth round, the early in the fifth round to the Chicago Bears. Tyree Gillespie in the fourth round to the Las Vegas Raiders. And Nick Bolton in the second round to the Kansas City Chiefs. We'll start right there. Nick Bolton staying in the state of Missouri. Yeah, this was a this is a really great draft weekend for Mizzou. Honestly, I can't remember the last time. I think 2015 was the last time we had five guys drafted. So, um, and just as far as like our expectations coming in, this really surpassed what we thought was going to happen as far as uh, like what rounds they were going in. So, uh, but Nick Bolton was a guy that we kind of pegged to be in that second round, kind of mid second round range. So we were pretty right about that. Um, but man, I love this pick. I was so excited. Uh, I just happened to be watching cause obviously I wanted to see who the chiefs were going to pick too, but, um, 
it just it seems like a match made in heaven almost you know just a a bruiser tough linebacker who's going to be a run run stopper I just think that makes so much sense for what the Chiefs need and I think he's got a really good opportunity to, to play right away yeah I don't know as much about the Chief, Chiefs as you do but um well their defense tends to or this past year tended to be pretty soft and they had run stopping issues all year long and uh I just seems like Nick Bolton's a guy that it's going to fit really well into what they want to do. Yeah. And they I mean they've got other young linebackers, outside linebackers who can who are fast and can play in coverage and can, you know, cover the outside to the field, but I think Nick Bolton has a really good chance to 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 even start on the inside as that Mike nice. linebacker. I definitely enjoyed seeing all the highlights when he got picked and the one that is just unforgettable is against Tennessee. Oh, I saw that a 100 times. I could watch it. I just I could have that on loop like just like projected in front of my vision all the time. <laughs> I saw a new angle of that highlight actually that was probably the best one I'd seen so far was like an aerial shot of it. It oh, was really? like a bird's eye view almost of just showing his path and then just showing oh, the yeah. Tennessee player just yeah. not advancing a single inch. Yeah, it's actually incredible because you don't often see a guy just get stopped absolutely dead in their tracks like that. Mm-hmm. And obviously the circumstances allowed that to happen, you know, just perfectly for Mizzou usually they somehow like get a foot on the ground and you know fall forward or something like that but the moment nick bolton lowered the boom on him he did not go one centimeter further towards the goal line yeah it was incredible uh so i definitely enjoyed watching all those highlights and it was cool seeing the chiefs fans um that i know in real life and like on twitter and stuff like that get excited for this pick and so now i have even living in Missouri and the Chiefs being so fun to watch like I already tuned in most of their yeah. games and now with Nick Bolton there that gives me another reason to root for the Chiefs yeah I'm so happy that I'm gonna be able to keep watching him play regularly and, and root for him but there was a lot of linebackers going off the board before him and I was starting to think that he might like even the end of the first round I was starting to think I wouldn't be shocked if he went here well he was on everybody's like top five of like best available going yeah, into day just, two just the way the linebackers were flying off the board i was um i was wondering if he could go earlier than i thought but i'm i'm happy with where he ended up <laughs> yeah i would say uh then tyree gillespie in the fourth round um producer cameron do you have where we what we predicted on that yeah kyle predicted him in the fourth and you predicted top two of the fifth oh okay well i wasn't too terribly far off uh, Tyree Gillespie to the Raiders. It seems like there's a lot of former Mizzou players in the AFC West. Yeah, there is. Um, when you draft somebody in the fourth round, and the same will be true for Larry Borum, I feel like that's not just like a throwaway pick. Like, no. You are investing some draft capital into this guy, and you are going to expect him to compete for some type of role. Yeah, I mean, when you're, when you're picking guys in the sixth and seventh round – or those undrafted free agents, I feel like you're kind of throwing darts mm-hmm. to some degree, and I just don't really always expect those guys to make the the roster, the 53-man roster. But um, I I would say Tyree Gillespie and Larry Borum both. I I would be shocked if they didn't make the the team roster at this point because that's yeah, like you said, that's that's a good amount of draft capital that uh, those guys should should definitely stick. Yeah, Larry Borum to the Bears. He potentially will be, be pr- protecting their new quarterback. Uh, Justin Fields yeah the, the Bears had a good draft and and Larry was was part of that they needed offensive line and so he's got an opportunity and then the sixth rounders uh, Bledsoe to the Patriots and we know they're very well run organization they got themselves a quarterback in Mac Jones um, so the future's bright there and then Larry Roundtree to the Chargers is very interesting because they do have um, young running back I can't remember his name. Well, they've got they have Austin Eckler. They've got Austin Eckler, but then they had just two backups. Yeah, Justin Jackson. And then the third guy, I can't remember his name. So kind of a crowded backfield there. I don't know if any of those guys departed in the off season, but obviously that's Eckler's job um, in Los Angeles, and you don't usually expect a six rounder to compete for much playing time. So, uh, but I don't know. I just feel like Roundtree's a guy that I feel like is maybe undervalued by the NFL, Mm -hmm. and he just 
performs on yeah. the field. So yeah, he's such a likable personality too. He just kind of brings that edge and that competitiveness that I think will impress works really hard in the weight room. Once he gets there, I think they'll be like, I'm glad we got this guy. Yeah. So yeah, it's, I mean, like you said, they do have a lot of bodies at running back, but it doesn't really anybody that it doesn't seem like they're that committed to any of them outside of Eckler. Right. So and uh, and Eckler's kind of a kind of a smaller pass catching back. Mm-hmm. So. I mean, I would love to see him paired with Roundtree, kind of almost like a with Tyler Beatty. I mean, they were just kind of opposite skill sets, and it would be really cool to see him get on the field. Um, but yeah, I mean, it is a little bit interesting that they that they went after him with such a crowded room. But maybe they just really uh, really liked him, saw something in him. And then Damon Hazelton did get picked up as an undrafted free agent by the Houston Texans. So we'll see if he sticks there. Uh, was there any other just overall draft thoughts that you wanted to? It, it does seem interesting that, you know, in a normal year, it seems like we get, you know, one or two guys drafted and then we have like five or six guys that are undrafted free agents, yeah. but it was the opposite this year. And uh, um, I just happened to be watching. I was actually watching, I think, them talk about Tyree Gillespie. I think I heard his name in the other room. So I came in and and uh, was watching them talk about Tyree because the picks are happening faster than they can analyze everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, and they want to give everybody at least a few minutes of showing their film and everything. So they were behind talking about Tyree. And then uh, on the screen, on the little bottom line, it says, you know, Chicago Bears pick Larry Borum. So oh, I was like, yeah. wow, that, <laughs> that just kind of all happened at once. But um, I would say that's probably the most surprising thing that happened was how high Larry Borum was picked. And um, I hope he makes us look stupid when mm-hmm. how we were kind of questioning his, um, his ability to – you know, get out in, in the pass game and, and move laterally. I mean, I think that's obviously a concern for anybody that's over 300 pounds, but he's super athletic and he just never, like we doubted him at Mizzou. Yeah. And, and whenever he made the, the switch to tackle and I doubted him when he was at Mizzou and he proved me wrong then right. very, very badly. Yeah. And there was even, you know, it was questionable him even just like not staying at Mizzou one more year. Um, mm-hmm. him even just going into the draft was kind of like okay I guess yeah this is a, a, a great example of a guy who made the right decision about when to leave yeah and leaving early yeah um, yeah I, I, I'm just thrilled with it's just it's only good for Missouri whether these guys have long careers in the NFL or not if you're just looking at it if you're not an NFL fan at all and you don't care what happens to these players um, after they leave Missouri um, football wise then it's just good to see the tiger logo on the screen missouri yeah just to say being we talked about we had so many guys drafted yeah is, and, and they were there missouri was throughout the entire draft i mean mm-hmm. the only thing we were missing was a first round pick and I, I do think you have to give barry odom a little bit of credit for getting these guys to missouri and, and none of these guys were very highly recruited all of these guys were probably three stars or below and you know and barry odom did a good job kind of developing them and you got to give coach shrink credit to because they probably all had their best season this year Mm -hmm. and so that probably still says something about both of those coaches to be able to elevate these guys to the level that they played yeah it's just huge for recruiting too to be able to point to these guys going to the nfl well kyle i think that's all i have to talk about but producer cameron has some kind of game that he wants to play and yes. he said it's going to be the best thing we've ever done on this podcast. I so he did not say so that. musical chairs holding them to some high standards here. Already, well, I just messaged you guys the schedule because I don't want you to look at any other version of the schedule. Okay, only this one. Um, and we're just going to kind of go through it, and I'm going to quiz you. Okay, <laughs> quiz me. Yep. Okay, okay. So, do you know... This is the Mizzou football 2021 schedule? Yes. Okay. Do you know which of these opponents is the first time meeting Mizzou? Uh, Boston College. Um, I'll go with... uh, I'll go with North Texas. Uh, Boston College is correct. Point for Kyle. Another answer I should have just copied would have been answer. Central Michigan was I, another oh option. Man, I thought about that. Okay. Oh, they were both correct? Yeah. Yeah, Central yeah. Michigan and Boston College. The Chippewas. Okay, so Kentucky. They have played Kentucky 11 times. I want you to guess the record against Kentucky. Um, they've played Kentucky 11, 11 times. times. Mm-hmm. I'll go with 4-7. and seven. 
That was exactly what I was going to say. I, I was um, going to say Boston College, and you got that. You, I guess we can say the same answer. Yeah, you can. But that'd be pretty lame of you. That'd be lame. I'll <laughs> say, got to do the math, uh, three and eight. With, oh, sorry, this is reversed from what I was thinking. They are four and seven I should have against just said Kentucky. It. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, this is a easy one. Okay. They've played four games against Southeast Missouri State. What do you think? The four no. Is? Four no. Correct. Better be. <laughs> Better be. Okay. Tennessee. They have played nine times. Okay. You want to know that record again? I'll say four and five. Um, I'll say five and four. Five and four. Dang. Let's go. Okay. North Texas, they've played once. Okay. It's got to be 1-0. Oh. Yeah, I'll go with 1-0. <laughs> yeah. I was waiting for you to be uh, like, what was the score of that game yeah. <laughs> or something like that? <laughs> no, I guess I should have looked up some extra little stuff on the easy ones, but that's okay. Um, Texas A&M, they have played that's 15 it. times. That's it? Wow. Okay. Former Big 12 folks. Yeah. 15 times. Do you remember uh, Texas A&M? Do you remember James Franklin? Last year in the Big 12, like oh yeah, bowling a guy over, <clears throat> just one of the best runs mm. ever from Missouri. Remember a guy named Johnny Menzel? I remember him. I was at the game. I've said it before on this you podcast. Said it before. I, I was at the game when Missouri clinched the SEC East. Uh, fun te- one. Texas A and M. How many I, games? I don't have as good of 15. a reference on this. <clears throat> um, Fifteen game. I'll say eight and seven. I'll say seven and eight. They are seven and eight. You've got to be kidding me. <laughs> At least we're both close on all these. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. They've played Vanderbilt 13 times. Hmm. Give me 10 and 3. I'll go 11 and 2. Kyle is closest. They are 8, 4, and 1. Oof. There's some old A games tie? in there. There's mm-hmm. some wow. old games in there. Yeah. Okay. Georgia, they have played 10 times. Uh... Uh, two and seven. Oh wait, ten times. Ten times. You can do it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think of it. I feel like there's one from a long time ago that Missouri won, but I'm just gonna say two and eight. That's what the first thing that came to mind. I'll say two and eight as well. Nine and one. Georgia's nine and one. Oh, okay, I yeah. was like, sorry, what? it's. Yeah, yeah. Reversed on. Uh, okay. okay. Yeah, no. they're one and nine against Georgia. Nine and one. Like, wow, like, <laughs> that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Okay, South Carolina. They've played eleven times. Kyle, you're down by one point. I'll let you go first. How many times? Eleven. Um. Jeez. Give me. Give me six and five. Ah, uh, man, I don't know. Give me five and six. I'll go six and five. Six and five. You got it. Go. <laughs> <laughs> no. Florida. Oh, man. <laughs> they have played ten times. Okay, Florida. Florida, Florida. How many Florida. times? Ten. Ten times. Four and six. Five and five. Five and five. I need to make you go first. Jeez, I'm just throwing out my opinion every single time first, and then you like say something slightly, but slightly different. Okay, last one. Arkansas. They've played ten times. Go ahead, Cam. I, I'm already lost by like three at this point. Uh, Arkansas. They played ten times. Uh, give Twelve. Me Twelve, times. Twelve times. Oh my gosh, that's much more difficult. Um, <laughs> 12 times. Does that include the bowl games, I'm assuming? Probably, yeah. I'll go with... Man. I'll go... Going, hard, going first is hard. With... Huh? Eight and four? I'll say seven, seven and five. Nine and three. Ooh, wow. I'm happy Good to be wrong on that. Missouri, yeah. <laughs> Arkansas sucks. So, of their... However many games this is. 12 games? Probably. Six of them, they lead the series. Two is the first meeting. 
Wow. And they're going to be one to know on both of those. Boston College kind of be a little going to be a little tricky. Yeah, Central Michigan. Don't sleep on that one. North Texas. They suck. Do they? <laughs> Southeast be... Missouri State. You can sleep on that one. Yeah, go to sleep on that. <laughs> that one that will not come back to bite us. Oh, well, cool anyway, game, right? Cool game. Fun Thank game you. time. Oh, well, yeah. I was looking at the fantastic. schedule. I was looking at the schedule last week and I was like, hmm, I think we could do something with these series records. We so could do something. I feel like do we did all right. With we didn't do anything too embarrassing. No, you guys were actually really close on all of them. Sur- were you surprised? Not surprised. Mm, not really surprised. No. <laughs> he thinks too highly of what us. What can we say? <laughs> All right, well, that's it for this week, I think. That's all I got for the folks. Yeah. All right, everybody. You can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or on Twitter, at Missouri Sports Pod, and you can email us at Missouri Sports Pod at gmail.com. You can find our t shirts and stickers on our online shop, Missouri Sports Pod.bigcartel.com, or head on over to our Patreon, and you can subscribe to that level that gets you the merch, and you can get a t shirt that way. Thank you, everyone, for listening. We will see you next week.